Hello, everyone. This is our our last community check in of the year. Um, and uh, today's focus with the community check in is going to be on on separate sections of the state and with a little focus on the businesses and how certain business areas are doing, but as well as uh, we'll go into some regional conversations um, with Peter Tommel and then go micro with Kim Jones in Fitchburg uh, and have two wonderful guests from Rockport um, to speak on the district and also one specific um, Susie Stories image that you see right there, the Bear Skin Neck um, in, in Rockport as well. Uh, my name is Luis Cotto. Um, I normally, uh, in pre-COVID times, we would be coming to you from the unceded lands of the Massachusetts, Wampanoag, and Nipmuc tribes in Boston area. I'm coming to you from the land of the Taino Indians of the Carib. Uh, and I'm saying that because when I speak, I might be um, uh, orally zoom bombed by a rooster or two. So if you hear that, um, that is coming from, from this end. Um, but as you, um, and I'm part of the community team um, and this is our community team right here. It is uh, myself, I'm the cultural districts program manager, Lisa Simmons, who's the team manager and also leads the festivals, um, grants uh, bucket. And then uh, Mina Kim, who's on the line, Timothy Afam, Ricardo Guillaume, and Veronica Ramirez Martel, um, all who are on the line. Um, this is what, how we uh, split up the work. Um, we all do regions, and as you can see the name with the color code, for instance, I do Greater Merrimack and the Metro West Valley working with local cultural councils in those regions. Um, and uh, the light, lighter color represents our 50, uh, our to date, 50 cultural districts. And so I also manage those. Um, and this is this is the breadth of the services um, that we offer at the Mass Cultural Council. Some some that people know, others that don't. And one quick um, update is that um, artists, individual artists, if you can, um, and those who represent individual artists, if you can let them know um, that the deadline for local cultural council grants throughout the Commonwealth is midnight December 14th, Monday, December 14th. There's the link there and, um, oh, I can't take it. Um, so Ricky, if you can also get that link and copy paste it onto the chat, that would be awesome. And also in collaboration with the governor's office of economic development, um, the agency has put out a, um, a cultural organization economic recovery program. It's a $10 million program with grants up to $100,000 to organizations and highly encourage you to take a look at that to see if uh, your organization or one that you work with um, uh, in collaboration qualify. Um, and there's the link for that right now. And the, and the deadline for that is on the 11th, which is this upcoming Friday. Today's agenda, and it's not youth programs, but that's okay, I made a mistake and put that in. Um, we have Trivi Hua, um, our Director of Engagement and Organizing for Mass Creative, giving us our regular legislative overview from the State House. And we're gonna be joined also by Peter Tommel, president of the Mohawk Trail Association. Um, Kim Jones, he, she's the owner of Strong Style Coffee in Fitchburg. You'll see her with the mask on because she's still she's currently open and in the coffee shop. And as well as uh, Michelle Brown, who is a community engagement coordinator for the town of Rockport and manages the Rockport Cultural District. She'll be joined by Doug Rich, who is co-owner of Susie Stories in Rockport. You can always um, put a question throughout in, in the chat, but we will probably deal with all of those um, towards the end. And with that, if that's okay, we'll start. Um, and if people wanna put their, their thing on speaker view, but we'll start with uh, Tree. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, one of the things we're working on Mass Creative right now, we're, we're trying to get our constituents to reach out to the governor's office 
asking him not to veto any part of the 18 million that is being proposed by the House and Senate um, for the creative sector. Um, and we're asking them to share their stories of why art is so important to them in their communities. Um, so if you can amplify that for us and uh, sort of remind the governor that there is uh, other important elements to this state than the business sector. I'm biased, of course. Um, we are also working on a recovery narrative, which we started um, a couple of days ago, balancing between stories of how the creative sector is still providing um, resources and um, completing their mission to enrich lives through this pandemic but they're doing it at a cost to themselves because the creative sector has lost so much um, resources. Um, so if you can help us, I'm going to put, um, if you can help us share these stories, I'm going to put the, the first one in the chat, which is about um, Boston's Gay Men's Chorus. Um, and it's an article talking about how they are continuing to do their work online while still um, understanding that that doesn't mean more resources isn't needed. And we are gonna be sharing these narratives throughout the next coming months so that we can push for uh, a larger recovery in the new legislative year. <clears throat> Give me one second. Also in January, we are theming our Arts for Mass uh, spotlights to center around arts education. <clears throat> around that time is when a lot of school budgets are created. And so we wanna remind them how important the arts are in school. So for the whole month of January, we're gonna be spotlighting um, all the different ways uh, art is used to empower young people from creative youth development to arts education in the school system. <clears throat> and once again, please share those stories with your constituents or um, reach out to me if you have any stories that you would want to um, want to sort of spotlight. I'm putting my email in the chat. And along with that, we are using the beginning of um, the coming year to help also set our policy agenda, um, but to do it in a way that includes community voices. So working up until March, we are gonna be speaking to and planning for five webinars that are gonna speak to different aspects of the creative sector from art and wellness, um, creative youth development, and our education, um, creative workers, and the creative economy, uh, community empowerment and justice, uh, and creative placemaking. Those are the rough frameworks in which we will tackle these um, areas. And considering that um, our topic for today is related to creative um, workers and creative economy, anyone speaking today interested in having further this conversation with Mass Creative? and how that can be part of our policy agenda setting, please reach out to me as well. Those are the big stuff we're working on right now. And like always, please reach out if there's any interest in any part of that. Vincent, thank you so very much. Um, it, uh, as, we, as we go on to the next speaker, I was wondering if you could um, find and, and put on the chat the um, uh, summary of the governor's new orders, bringing different um, different segments back to phase one. I was trying to find it as you were talking, and I couldn't find it. So I don't know if you have it readily available. And then, but now we'll, we'll segue over to Peter Tamil, who's the president of the Mohawk Thank you very much, Timothea. Um, the Mohawk Trail Association. And I'm looking forward to this because um, my 
what I know of the Mohawk Trail is it has one of the most awesome and most scary pin turns in all roads <laughs> as you head up to North Adams, depending on who you're riding with. So, um, uh, Peter, thank you for joining us. Take it away, please. Thank you. Um, of course, I'm a regional tourism council. Uh, we promote all sectors of the tourism industry from the cultural aspect to restaurants, shopping, lodging, outdoor activities. We encompass it all. And I will echo what the first uh, speaker said. Now is the time to ask the governor to keep the budget intact and support our local businesses. Our local businesses are the mom pops of the down street main street. And that's one of the reasons my local campaign um, is such a great campaign. Uh, the Mod Office has worked very hard on this campaign with Think August. And you can see this is the website to go to and there's different partners on it. And if you click on my, uh, for the business section, there are many pieces to this campaign. There are logos you can use to put um, on your Facebook, on your email signatures. There's flyers you can print for your window and put them in your window. There's inserts you can put in your shopping bags. And so if you go to each one of these different sections, you can download different bags for social media. We, there's a campaign going on, of course, a social media campaign going on. There's radio spots, there's TV spots, there's been newspaper spots, there's local billboards driving people to local businesses downtown, all the, diff all the different aspects from everything, from your mom and pop grocery store to your florist, to your jeweler, to your coffee shop, to B&Bs and stuff like that. You know, we tell everybody, shop local, think local, but also think out of the box with this campaign. With this campaign, you, there's many things that can go on. You can, can buy gifts to, to give to people that maybe don't normally go to the coffee shop to have coffee, or they don't go to the little, the little store down the street to buy a gift. Or maybe you want to buy a gift, and there's also a section that you can download that if you bought a gift, from a local retailer or a business, you can print out a tag and you can ha take it and use it as your gift pack for that gift. There's many different pieces on this website, um, as you can see up here, that for the toolkit. And you know, if you have any questions, you know, if you reach out to the Matt office, somebody will help you in the Matt office if you have some questions on uh, how to do different things but it is a great resource and it's a great campaign um, with the whole state pulling together, all the RTCs, all the partners, um, really a, just a grassroots campaign. You know, to go along with that from our culture on our end, you know, the tourism end was the number one sector that was hit very heavily, you know, with the shutdown of our cultural institutions and stuff like that. And I was very, I'm very lucky in my region that my cultural institutions like Williams College Museum of Art, last year, they were gonna be doing a renovation on their, on their museum. So they made an outdoor exhibit of 15 different pieces of artwork spread out through the campus. So when this happened, that became a really good thing for them to push because people could still see our work and be outside. In the same sense, the Clark Art Institute was already planning an outdoor exhibit on their hiking trails, because they have 140 acres of outdoor space, and they put it, installed contemporary art from six different artisans throughout their thing that you go see. Mass Smoke did the same thing throughout the whole Thing. Between the three, three museums, there's over 30 pieces of outdoor art stretching across 10 miles. That doesn't count the murals that local artists have painted on the sides of different buildings 
old factories and stuff. So we kind of we kind of lucked out, so to speak, that we had some of the things already in place to help us with that. But then as this kind of closed down came and people had to reopen, we found that as a region, a lot of our small businesses thought out of the box and started doing different things. We have a business that never offered any incentives, anything, it did an incentive program where if you bought something in September, you could get a 10% discount in October at another purchase. And every time you purchased, you got a card to go forward. We have, we have a retailer that she's offering free gift wrapping in her business for people that are buying local. We have a lot of them that never did online sales before that have set up simple websites and started doing online sales. Um, as anything, we're all in this together. We're all a big family and everybody has to. And if you've got a great idea, share it with your neighbor. Or maybe you partner with your neighbor to do something. We have a local B&B who has tried to, you know, be really cautious about things. So she gives her guest uh, a little gift coupon gift to, to go get coffee and muffins or whatever at a local coffee shop. The coffee shop and her made a great deal and she gets a reduced price and they said everybody goes in and spends more than what their, their coupon is worth. And so again, think out of the box to do things. Admit, you know, every neighbor can help. And don't think of your neighbor as a competition. Think of them as your main street getting stronger if you all work together and you all do a promotion together. And if you're not taking uh, use of the my local, you know, just a few simple things, print the poster out, put it in your window, on your door, so that when people see that ad on TV, when they see the billboard, they'll recognize the symbols and they're like, oh, they're part of my local campaign. I'll pass it on to the next person. Thank you, Peter. You're welcome. That was great. Um, and as you take that, um, a hairpin turn <laughs> south, southeast, and you keep going east on, on Route 2, eventually you will come to the second hilliest town in the United States. <laughs> I don't know how they found that out, but that is so cool. And you would never, you would never question it if you had to walk anywhere except for the downtown area which is like a straight shot anything north and south is just hills but um uh into Fitchburg and uh just to contextualize our next space um I think everyone knows the wonderful Fitchburg Art Museum which is close to the common over there and uh a walk back half a mile 15 minutes um uh back down Main Street you get to um this old street that was just paved over called Mill Mill Street and down in that, what is now just a long, big alleyway. Um, there are two really great creative um, spaces. One is an instrument shop and the other is a strong style coffee that was opened by Kim. Uh, it was a tea parlor before, but strong style coffee was opened two years ago. Um, and, uh, and it's not like just these two things like this uh, weight and barbells, like in the middle, there's some beautiful, um, Peter talked about um, murals, but beautiful murals by um, a good friend of ours, Nora Valdez, at least a sculpture in the middle across from the Fitchburg, the iconic Fitchburg mural, but as well as Caleb Nealon from Cambridge, internationally known muralist with his figures there. Um, really beautiful stuff, and y'all have added to it. And um, Kim Jones, the owner of the coffee shop, and keep in mind, Ray Oldenburg back in the day created this concept or penned the concept of a uh, a uh, third place and a uh, third place is a place outside home and work where people just get together to congregate to start cultural revolutions and um, people, you know, it could be a library, it could be a, a barber shop, uh, but we're going to talk to two incredible ones today, a coffee shop and a bookstore. Um, so Kim, take it away. I'm um, going to try to gracefully share my screen here. Sure, definitely. Um, here we go. Let's see. Did that work? Oh, OK. 
Okay, it's subtitling and everything. How do I make that stop? There we go. All right. Is that good for everyone? Can you see it? Perfect. All right. So um, I opened Strong Style Coffee in August of 2018. Um, I grew up in Fitchburg. I've always been here. And um, when I opened, part of the impetus was I was in Fitchburg on a Sunday and there was nothing open. Um, and I walked down Main Street and it was really sad because there was nothing. And I thought, you know what? This needs to change. Um, so I um, opened Strong Style with the hopes of just creating a place that was always open, always available, and anyone could come. Um, so I decided to, to sort of show you some pictures so you can sort of see for yourself what the heart of Strong Style is. Um, we, pre-COVID, I guess, we were open from seven in the morning to 11 at night. Um, our entire shop is filled with murals um, from local artists and all sorts of other crazy artwork and tchotchkes. Um, and every night we had something. So sometimes during the day we would have children's performances. Um, we have open mics and poetry nights. Um, you name it, we will host it pretty much. Um, the only kind of rules that we have here is that everything is always all ages and as much as we can have it, it's always free um, because Fitchburg um, is a struggling city still and we we wanted it to be appropriate for the city, um, but that this city deserves really nice things despite the fact that it's struggling. So, um, and this place really is a home. Every artist that comes gets to sign the lockers like in high school, it's really fun. So we have kind of this living history on the lockers and it's been eye-opening because Fitchburg's always had some great artists. You know, we have this art museum that's fostered some really, really great art in the city. And we've, we've had on and off um, some wonderful studios that have done well. We had um, Sitka Gallery, we had Umbrella Gallery. And so art's really been such a huge part of us. Um, and opening this, I just realized we have so many amazing artists that are just weird enough that they would not maybe have ever gotten the main stage. And that's really who we showcase here. Um, we really want, want the weird, we want the eccentric, we want the people that don't quite have a home anywhere else and they've just blossomed in this place is um, really just become a home for so many people. Um, so kind of pre-COVID we were balancing, you know, we had our food, our coffee, our beer, and we had all of this entertainment and art. And it was a great balance because one kept the other alive in terms of kind of a business model. Um, and then, you know, we had a really busy, I just showed you a sample of one month. This is what was happening at the shop. So it was every night because that's what Fitchburg needs. We have a university, all sorts of stuff going on. And, you know, people needed a place to go. So um, I was really fortunate that I opened um, a month before the TDI folks came to Fitchburg. And our, you know, kind of all of this cool placemaking stuff and arts and culture really kicked off. And, and um, I feel like I benefited from that because we got Mill Street right outside. And so this first picture is what it looked like before. Um, the dumpsters that you see in the back actually live there all the time. It housed dumpsters. And this is the walkway. Um, that Luis was speaking of earlier. It was literally just a walkway. It wasn't very well lit. Um, nobody really went there. And at night, it wasn't, you, people didn't feel all that comfortable um, coming to the shop. And we do have a nice patio. So it was, you know, it was a place that we really wanted to see safe. Um, so Mill Street with lots of help from the Art Museum, um, Fitchburg State University was instrumental um in partnering to create this there were so many i mean they have their own facebook page and you can see all the people that donated so i don't have to go through it but so many people and the community 
got involved. Um, we have beautiful murals now and lights and cameras in the parking garage and some life um, and color. And, you know, you we see everybody from, you know, really kind of sweet elderly couples to young kids just walking and looking at the murals. And it's, it's great. It's changed the landscape um, kind of both figuratively and literally. Um, so here are just some events. Um, we are fortunate that there's a little tree in front of us and the tree is within our, our sort of patio. So we get to use that. And then right outside our patio area is a beautiful stage that um, the community uses and we use as well. Um, so then March happened. And this is the last picture of our last show um, before we had to sort of shut down. And it was, you know, you never expect it, right? I mean, everyone sort of feels that way. Um, so I just wanted to share kind of what we've done. You know, um, Peter talked a lot about kind of being innovative and, and trying new things. So we did. Um, we tried to really stay true to our mission of being part of the community. Um, and while all of the arts and culture um, that kind of was going on, it was still happening. It was just happening online. Um, you know, our, our weekly open mic folks kept it going on a live open mic on Facebook and we had poets reading on Facebook. So a lot of that kept going, but we had this shop that had a commercial kitchen and Fitchburg is, um, you know, really has a problem with food insecurity as does all of North Central Mass. Um, and there are some really, um, there's some food deserts in our area. So I couldn't just sit on an empty commercial kitchen. It just didn't feel right. So we partnered with a local nonprofit called Growing Places. Um, and Growing Places mission is to deal with food insecurity in North Central Mass. And so we use the commercial kitchen to package food um, that was donated. Um, so you'll see the row of market basket bags. That's actually all produce from local farmers in North Central Mass that was purchased and then donated to schools and senior centers. Um, and there we are like masked and gloved up cutting stuff. Um, and then we were able to open to go in part time. So we've got staff there. And when we could open, we realized that there was no um, grocery store, like a small grocery store on Main Street. So we stocked with some supplies, you know, we had pastas and beans and sauces and things that were kind of reasonably priced um, for the staples. But then we had some fun stuff if people wanted to prepare for a date night indoors or whatever, um, because this community needs a lot. And we just didn't want to, we just didn't want to be selfish during this. We're so lucky to be able to be open. Um, so we really wanted to give back. Um, we also did a fundraiser for growing places so they could continue to provide um, food. So there's a picture in the corner of a local catering company that used our spot to hand out to-go meals that were purchased as part of a fundraiser. Um, and then now here we are, we kind of opened back up and we had to reinvent. So we opened up full time. We allowed indoor seating for a couple of weeks. Um, and because of everything, we ended up baking all of our own stuff, which has been very successful. So now we have a vegan bakery. So if anyone is in Central Mass and you need a vegan bakery, you can come see us. Um, but then we went back to takeout only because I'm sure you all have heard about Fitchburg on the news and our um, unfortunate rise in COVID cases. Um, so we went back to takeout only because um, it's just my, I have one, well, two staff and I, and but there's just two of us here all the time and we have families, so it wasn't worth it because um, my staff is my family, you know, they're, um, I just don't want anything to happen. So we decided that since we had this beautiful space, we would just open it up to local artists who didn't have a brick and mortar. So right now our shop, that's what all of the pictures are. It's just open to artists. Um, and pretty much anyone can call and say, hey, I have art and we'll try to make room for you. Um, because, you know, shipping prices are exceptionally high right now and it's really hard to run a business on Etsy. 
So we just want to do what we can um, to make sure that our community has a place still, even though it's not the same place it was before. Um, and then eventually we'll get back to live music and poetry and all the stuff that we love doing here. Um, so, and I, I just think it's, you know, we, we try to just be a representation of Fitchburg um, and really look at the needs. And Fitchburg is, despite COVID, we're still growing. And it's amazing to hear, you know, they're still planning murals right now to um, do another round of murals out on Mill Street, but also do some other murals. Um, we have Monique Guthrie, an artist in the city is painting a mural like, you know, it just got a little too chilly. So I think she just finished it up, but she was in here last week, you know, getting coffee and tea. Um, so the city's still really kind of just moving forward. And I, I love that it's continued to support artists um, and continue to stay true to who they are, um, despite, you know, all the struggles that every city has faced. Um, so we just really want to represent that and be kind of stewards of that in the best way that we can. So that's it. <laughs> that's awesome, Kim. Um, I have to say that, uh, well, two things. One, uh, being from Puerto Rico, I noticed the, the murals, the, the paintings along Mill Street. Um, there's one that is a petroglyph of uh, a Taino petroglyph yes. um, of a coqui. And um, so when I saw that, I was like, oh, so it, you know, irrespective of where you're coming from, it, it, it gives, you know, it would make me feel welcome then, right? And, um, and also I would encourage people to do this with many. I was looking on Google Maps and they have this time lapse thing. So they keep their photos of where everything is. And so you can go to a space and see what, you know, see what it looks like now, but depending on the place with Fitchburg, you can go back to 2008. Mm -hmm. and see that and it's just um just really interesting seeing how a space breathes right yes. um and uh it's just really beautiful thank you for your work this no is a great space um and with that instead of the road because i honestly don't know how to get from fitchburg to rockport unless i come all the way down and then go all the way up i'm just gonna make believe i have my icarus wings and go across <laughs> to a wonderful cape and corner of Rockport and um, one of my favorite cultural districts, um, the Rockport Cultural District, um, managed by good friend Michelle Brown. Um, and um, yeah, take it away. So I hear I can share my screen. Um, and so um, I found out that I was supposed to have some photos ready for everyone. And so my apologies for, for being a little distracted. I was listening to everybody and Kim kudos for how much you've had going. Um, but so Rockport is, um, is known, there's this red fishing shack that supposedly is the most painted uh, building in the world. And so we just wanted to make sure that everybody knew exactly where that red fishing shack is, because I'm sure that everyone has seen it a time or two. And so here's our little lovely uh, motif number one, uh, beautifully decorated for the holidays with our annual wreath. Um, so, so there we go. Um, Luis, what do you want me to talk about? <laughs> uh, well, one thing, one thing that, um, and with our culture districts, we, we connect every two weeks. We just have a culture district check in to say, hey, how are you doing? And sometimes it turns into, you know, just um, just uh, trying to get ideas from each other, but, you know, commiserating about like the pains of, of everything since March. Um, and Rockport has actually um, had a really good season um, in the neck and in the district um, with, every, you know, better than expected. So I guess um, if you could speak to your experience with that and, and like the why, why, why did you think? And the, my, my two times there during since March, um, I found the COVID protocols to be like, like on point. Like, you know, there was no, people were wearing their masks. Um, there weren't like more, and these are small shops, right? There weren't more than like two or three or four people in a space. 
So everyone, it seemed to me everyone bought into, right, like the social contract that is like, you know, COVID-19 protocol. So, um, so if you can just go into that for a bit. Okay, so um, so I'll go all the way. It sounds like I'll go all the way back to the beginning. So, when COVID was was um, when everything was hitting back in the spring, um, thankfully, thankfully there were some things in place. Um, so we have a tool called Basecamp in which we talk to all of the businesses. We have regular meetings with all of the businesses in town, um, and thankfully, it's a town full of creatives, a town full of artists who, um, when we all come together. Uh, great things, great things come about. People share thoughts and ideas, and and we find ways to hash them out and then to execute them. Um, so back in the spring, we actually partnered with some of the other um, communities on Cape Ann. Uh, we partnered with uh, through Discover Gloucester and the Cape Ann Chamber, um, and we held uh, regular meetings with all of the businesses and all the different sectors. So we have. Um, our artists who also have galleries, we have our creative makers um, who also have retail locations, we have restaurants, we have lodging, um, and then we have our event venues. Uh, so thankfully, everybody was able to come together and have, um, you know, some great meetings to, to share um, where the difficulties were um, and, and how we can partner together to, to get things done. Um, as, as different protocols became available, um, we would have information from the Board of Health available. We would have them on calls with us. Um, uh, when it came time to um, walk through the pandemic unemployment or the PPP grants and loans, we, um, we worked with everyone to make sure that they had the, whatever tools they needed. And, you know, it was a really busy time of, of how do they open, but yet how do they be safe and then keeping everything straight. Um, I, I really have a lot of respect for all of the business owners, all the artists, all the creatives. Um, there was a lot to figure out and, and they really did a great job and I'm really proud of all of them. Um, it was really quite an honor to be able to work with them through all of that. Um, so we transitioned most of our marketing um, when all of this was happening. We, you know, from going to the different uh, tourism uh, seminars and, and watching the different statistics and and hearing the feedback from the different surveys that people were doing, we knew that people were looking um, to be able to get outside, to uh, be in a safe place. They wanted to feel that safe, that safety, um, and they they were looking for things to do that they could that they could feel safe with their families. So um, we transitioned everything, and and everybody, you know, it was a very easy story to tell because all the business owners. Um, really stepped up to make sure that they were doing everything that they needed to. They had, um, and they still have their hand sanitizer as soon as they walk in the room, as soon as you walk into one of their shacks um, or their storefronts. Um, they have the um, letters right there at the door to let you know how many people can come in. And thankfully, the majority of the guests, you know, of course, every town had their few that didn't want to wear masks or didn't want to socially distance. But the majority of people who came to Rockport this year they were they were respectful and and they were a joy to have in the town and and everyone really enjoyed having them there um so uh got through the spring as and into the summer the summer you know again everyone did great and then as we came through to the holiday season we knew that we had to transition a little bit more um the holidays are a very busy time traditionally in rockport we have a lot of large events that draw eight to ten thousand people to town at a time and we knew that we couldn't have, um, we, we just couldn't have that many people coming at one time. It, it wouldn't be good for the town. None of the businesses wanted large crowds in at any one time, um, but we still needed to tell the story. We still needed to remind people that we were there. Um, and so we created Holidays in Rockport, which instead of being um, um, a, a one day affair, we created these, um, we created different things like this is our, uh, North Pole, um, the magical mailroom that we've told a story to people that since Santa couldn't come in on a lobster boat, instead Santa chose us to be um, one of the locations for his magical mailroom. And so we have kids from all over the Commonwealth coming and we have Mrs. Claus and the elves who are coming to, um, you know, they're all responding by, by writing handwritten notes to all the kids. So all the kids who 
leave their their mail with their addresses, get a handwritten card back from um, Santa and his little helpers. Um, so, it, it, you know, it, it's um, a trial and error. Some things work better than others, um, but we've just been trying to do what we can. And we created these um, art, we created a holiday tree art stroll. Uh, Rusty and Ingrid, who are one of the creatives in our town, um, Rusty had designed these trees years ago um, with the project that he wanted to do in his town um, or in his shop. And, um, and we were able to partner with the Rockport Rotary in which 68 of these trees have been cut out. Um, the Rotary cut them, sanded them, primed them, and then we got them to all of the artists and creatives. Uh, so like this front pick, the front tree, um, you know, that's done by one of our muralists, Josh Falk. Uh, the tree in the center that's very bright and colorful there, that's actually in partnership with the Rockport Schools. Um, so we did everything we could to provide an opportunity um, for everyone to give back. Um, and it's just been such a joy to, to plan for the holidays. So um, I'm not sure what, what more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's great because now um, I'd love to hear um, from Doug again, co-owner of Susie Stories, and um, just a, a more micro view of um, one your space and and also how how did this you know how did this happen for you from March to the present and how how did you do and and what what's on the horizon for you and and your wife. Okay, all great questions. Can you uh, can you hear me? Does sound yes. okay? Okay, great. So first of all, we, uh, much like Kim, so we opened in June of 2018, around the second week of June. So we haven't been here long and uh, there's a lot we don't know. We don't know what we don't know, but um, it's been a great experience so far. I gotta say, Kim, first of all, your flexibility on the way you adapted to different conditions was amazing. All the things you bought in, it was pretty outstanding. So we like to think that we try to incorporate some of that. We have, um, I can actually show you, uh, but our bookstore is, I could throw, uh, it's it's probably 10 by 10 by 17, 10 by 20, the actual space to walk around in our store. It's a very tiny bookstore, but uh, um, maybe I, a little bit bigger than that, but it's, it's a very small space. But we've managed, I think, to do a lot with it and it seems to work well for the purpose that we kind of conceived of it. And when we opened last year, the goal was to be a children's bookstore only. My wife, um, in her spare time, she managed to carve out some time between her career in social services and other things she does um, to actually write uh, five children's books. So as we were just up here visiting Rockport, um, she hadn't been here before. We came up to visit a friend of mine. We hung out. She loved it. And we came back several times in 2018, discovered a space that was for lease. And then the idea kind of grew to do a bookstore from there. Great timing for us because um, there really wasn't a new bookstore currently open in Rockport. Um, something that the community loves and had grown up with had just closed maybe a, a year and a half or so before we got here. We weren't really aware of all that history at the time. So it seemed like a good space to actually open up a bookstore. Um, and we've tried to make it a very comfortable space, a very inviting space, first of all, for kids. Now we've kind of, um, we moved away from strictly being a kid's bookstore. Now we were kind of a full service bookstore inside of our space. So we offer everything from bestsellers, fiction, nonfiction, um, to the kids books that we started with. So our goal kind of is pretty simple. So we just want to really, when somebody comes into our space, um, we just want to actually surprise them. We want them to find something here that they didn't expect to find in terms of books, uh, something different um, as well as some familiar things. So we think we've succeeded with that based on what our, uh, what our clients tell us. That's the goal. We just want to be a resource for recommendations as well uh, for anything that customers are looking for and just to have it feel like, kind of feel like home when people come in. And so that's been the goal and that's what we continue to try to, to, uh, to focus on. Um, I think our size, our small size has been an advantage to us during, during the COVID, during the pandemic period. So there's really two of us. There is the CEO who you can see is not here in the store. And there is me, the employee, who is usually here in the store doing all the footwork, um, but it works well. And at, at, it takes advantage of each of our strengths actually, because I actually am the person based on my previous uh, 
all of my past uh, work I've done as a professional, as a musician is always around interfacing with people. So that's what I love to do. And uh, that's what I can do here in the store. Um, so it's taken us time to actually get known here in the community, but that's working well. So one thing about Rockport we've discovered because we're not from Rockport is that um, people tend to come down here. Even pe people from Rockport tend to visit um, different parts of Rockport at different times of the year. So you have to get to know your audience. And it takes time to get to know the people from Rockport or from Cape Ann. Um, but as we get to do it, um, we're always offering to, uh, we order for people, they can do it by phone, web, email, uh, call it, and, uh, you know, we will do our best to find anything that uh, the customer's looking for, make recommendations, and we deliver as well. Um, so that's kind of, that customer focus has kind of worked well for us. So we have people coming in. Word of mouth is working well, um, and the word kind of spreads slowly. So we're just, we're being patient and just trying to grow the business little by little. But even this year, uh, during the pandemic, our business, our revenue increased greatly. We had a great, a great year this year as opposed to our first year. Um, some of that's just natural because it would happen as we get known better. But we also feel, um, I think we, we managed to take advantage of uh, some things like the fact that because libraries were closed, um, people expressed frustration with, you could still get books from the library, but you had to, you had to basically order up front. You couldn't go in, you couldn't touch, couldn't do the things you could usually do in a library. People miss that experience. And at certain times during this year, we were, we were able to offer that experience. Uh, what we did um, through this whole pandemic is we just followed the state guidelines very closely. And so after our, after our initial year, we were kind of excited to get started with year two and kind of really drive this thing. And then we found out, well, we can't open the store. So curbside, um, curbside service was the first thing we could do. So when that was first opened up by, by Massachusetts, that's what we did. And because of our small space, we were actually able to kind of serve people. I opened the door, they could see a lot of our inventory and we could just share with them through a tablet what we had. Um, so we kind of did curbside service to our door. That was the first thing we did. And as we went through the phases with, uh, with the state and we managed to open up in the summer, um, you know, we, we have uh, we're probably a limit of, uh, of three or four people, unless it's a family that is together, that work well. We just ask people to be patient and, and take their time to come in and that work well. So that's kind of what we've done. Um, we were working on um, community events before the pandemic. Last year, when we opened in the summer, we had several author events. We would have, we would have uh, readings. Uh, we had everything from a, uh, uh, an 87 year old poet from Manchester who came in one day and just wanted to read to anyone who walked in the store and she had a book uh, to, we had a young man from Washington, D.C. who had a career in marketing. He decided to write a children's book on Tom Brady. Um, so he had his first, his first offer event anywhere, even though he's from D.C., was up here at Susie's Story in Rockport. Very unusual, but we had a great time. Uh, so we had a number of events where we wanted to get people involved from the community. Um, and then when we couldn't do that, we tried to pivot to doing online events. So we do have, for instance, um, with uh, the town of Rockport, we're doing a, ch a children's book reading for the holidays. Um, so every, every week, once a week during the month of December, we read a different children's book. Um, we'll read some classics too. So this week we'll probably do a, Ezra Keys' a, a Snowy Day. And so we just like to share those. And we're also doing some author events for, for first time authors too. So we have a novelist that we're actually hosting an event for uh, tomorrow at uh, seven o'clock, a woman named Jennifer, Jennifer Smith Turner who's written her first novel. She's a published poet. She's written a very interesting novel and it's got a lot of good uh, critical reviews. But it's a coming of age story of a young girl who's uh, who uh, is raised in the segregated South. So we're gonna have her tomorrow. We're very excited about doing things like that. That's how we try to expand, um, you, know, our, you know, expand the brand and get out the, the word to more people. So basically um, that's our story. I don't know if there's anything else I can add to it, but that's that's what we're doing. Little by little, person by person, trying to build relationships and bring people back and uh, just expand what we offer in terms of books. And we pay a lot of attention to what our customers respond to when in the store, what they ask for. We have discussions with them and then we try to um, you know, furnish the bookstore appropriately based on what we perceive to be their needs. And uh, that's it. That is a really great story. Thank you so very much, Doug. Um, it, 
uh, and and the timing again having having to be your second year that you would have hopefully experienced a bump anyways and especially have it come during the pandemic um points to a bright future the best of luck to you and your wife and susie's stories um one last um one last one last rockport thing and i'll share my screen right now um again i'm the manager of the cultural districts here and we worked with Rusty from Rusty and Ingrid in Rockport. They also have a space in Salem to create the new cultural district signage that um, people will see uh, throughout uh, the Commonwealth. Um, he worked with us to create these five themes, um, a Mill River theme, which is more like gateway cities, coastal, metropolitan, um, then rural and Main Street. Uh, and we were lucky, um, like I, you know, when we decided to um, try and do this again, because we had one attempt that didn't work out, people didn't like the design. Um, like we, we said, well, let's, let's try and get someone, you know, one of the designers from one of our districts and, and reached out to Rusty and, um, and worked with them to do this. It's been like a two year process. And the districts have just started getting them in the past month and putting them up. So on our social media presences, we've been we've been posting them. Uh, I know East Hampton, Great Barrington has posted them. Um, and I also wanted to say because thank you very much, Tree. We love them. Um, at the, as I peeked through, I noticed um, Kim. I love the way the way you said we have this space. How can we help someone else, especially when you when you work with the concept of food insecurity? And we saw a number of spaces do that. I noticed that Tia was here earlier from Lynn, another great place to just walk around, right, with all their murals. But um, their cultural district decided to oh, she's still there. Um, decided to to what you call it, work with food insecurity as well, and did a lot of collecting, a lot of distribution, and and it's just like when we can't do. We're not just here to do what our mission says we got to do, right? Like our mission is really the community, and if we care about a community, if we can't like sell this, let's do this. And um, kudos to them. Um, but as far as walkability, I also noticed that Sandy from Fall River was here. They have an incredible, um, incredibly awesome walkable district along the water, the waterfront there in Fall River. Um, and that's one of the things I took away from Peter's. Peter's talk with um, the spaces, even like what is it in Williamstown? Was it Clark that or Williamstown College? The the all, all our institutes like Williams College when they were closing the museum, they moved fifteen pieces of artwork outside so people could still see it. The Clark has great hiking trails normally, and they were already in the process of putting artwork outside so that people could still see the artwork but be outdoors and be hiking and be, you know, and Mass Smoke could do the same thing. And I just think it's amazing that within a 10 mile area, we have over 30 pieces of artwork outside, not counting the murals that are on different places and stuff. I mean, throughout the whole Mohawk Trail region with outdoor murals and mosaics, Shelburne Falls has a lot of mosaics outside on um, that walls, that we have these great walking things and stuff that people can do. One of my businesses talking about actually having a punch card that if you go picture, at the, different cult, the different artworks outside, you'll be able to go and get a discount at their place for uh, a dessert. Yeah, no, it's... um. The, the innovation that this has forced um, is uh, incredible. And I think one thing that we can all do if we don't own a space, we can approach spaces and say, hey, would you be willing to do this? And, and I can help, right? Because we, we don't have to get paid for everything. Um, well, one of the things is if, you know, and I did this years ago when I was the president of a chamber of commerce that we had a lot of empty storefronts downtown but we had a lot of businesses that were not downtown. We got the storefronts to allow the businesses that were downtown to put merchandise and displays in the window. 
with the signage of where they were and then local businesses downtown did some a little display in the ones that were off not the main street it was the cross reference and stuff and i will tell you that worked out very well the empty windows look great and it promoted that cross stuff Thank you, and and my audience over here is telling me that the time is <laughs> the time has come to say goodbye. Um, thank you, all our panelists, for joining again. This will be we will put this up on YouTube, and we tend to tab it on YouTube so you can go, you can go. We'll go straight to when people spoke, um, so you can share it in, in many different ways. But it's it's super encouraging for us to hear it and to know that people are well during this, this yucky time. And we wish um, just the same wellness and, and healing to y'all during these holiday, uh, this holiday period. And um, thank you so very much. Kim, Peter, Tree, Doug, Michelle, um, from all of us to y'all, thank you very much. Thank you. Peace. Happy holidays everyone, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Adios.